Hey survivors, thanks for coming back to the Apocalypse Post. I'm your host, Makeshift, and I've got another workshop for you from Wasteland Weekend last year. This time hosted by Mark Cordry from the UK. He's a professional costumer and prop maker specializing in the post-apocalyptic and sci-fi genres. And that includes some puppets that would have Jim Henson screaming, Valhalla! Make sure you're subscribed and hit that alert bell so you never miss an episode. And here's Mark. My favorite tool is this. Yeah. For aging yeah. fabric. Mm -hmm. But also backed up with one of these. These give two different effects. Uh, this is much heavier damage. And uh, this is just for fluffing things up. <laughs> so I'm gonna start with this. I'm just gonna uh, basically just a rug up collar here. Again, collars, cuffs, elbows, all those edges, those are the things which really take the most punishment. Working on an edge with one of these, you Mark just Blake. really go to, really go to town on it. Should we say what that thing's actually called so they can find it? This is a surf, well, I call it a surform. That's what it's called here. That's too. a surform here. S U R F O R M. So, really handy little things. And as you can see, really quickly, they rip up the edge on the surface. Nicely. Is that to be Always work on an edge. No, um, uh, I have done goes. my knuckles so oh, many times. Oh, so no. don't don't try and do oh. that, otherwise you're gonna shave your fingernail or your knuckle and this oh, yeah, yeah. So working on a, on an edge and taking some yeah most of my workbenches and tables have got really nice round edges now. Yeah. Yeah. Just really go to town on it, and you can see how much damage really quickly you can cause with one of these. Yeah. Once you've done that, I like to take one of these and just pull out fibres. Now this 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 fluffs the surface up. That'll rip it. This pulls the individual fibres, yeah, the cotton or the fabric out and gives a really nice fluff to it. Now, what I find works really well is after you've done that and you've done all your holes and your damages and your surface texture, shove it in the washing machine because the action of the washing machine mats all those fibers together and makes it look as if they've been matted for quite some time. And they're nice and fluffy, it looks a bit fresh. Yeah, once all those fibers have matted down, it has much more of a feeling of age and depth to it. Mm. I'm just going to need to water my mouth again. Mm, okay. So finding that surform shaver here in the U.S. it's a little difficult. I, I got it here for the workshop. You can find it at uh, you can find them at Home Depot if you look. They'll be in like the carpentry section or like with the drills and saws and stuff. Um, you can also find them online. Yeah, I, and I, that's sometimes called a one-handed version because they have other versions as well. I set Jared quite a task when he said, oh, what's your shopping list? So I gave him a shopping list. <laughs> I have no idea what half of this is. So, <laughs> but yeah, different different terms for tools. <laughs> but yeah, as Jared rightly says, you'll find this in, like, it's generally used for rough shaping wood. It's a file, it's a heavy based file. Um, the other good thing about these is you will find that along one edge, They've got a load of raw spikes. Now these are immensely useful for putting rips. Just little holes, which again, add a surface texture to your fabric. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And all you're doing is pulling up a little piece, just a small amount, because this is how you texture up, you can probably see from here, mm -hmm. but this is how you're texturing up the small, the flat areas, yeah? giving them a bit of volume, giving them a bit of interest, a bit of surface texture, not leaving them just flat, yeah? Without taking huge fucking holes in them and your ass is hanging out or your knees are hanging out. But even if you do that, that's not a problem because then you repair it. And in the process of that repairing, you're adding more to the story of the thing that you're making. Again, you want a, something which looks as though it has lived on you for the past 20 odd whatever years, since the world ended. What I also find is a lot of fabrics will have double seams, yeah? 
A double seam is really useful. You get, you know, especially on jeans, trousers, jackets, whatever. Because what I do. Feel free to come closer if you want, guys. Too. Yeah, please do. What I do is just put some cuts in between the seams. And what you're doing there is you're not weakening the actual item. That seam's not going to fall apart because you're between two stitches. But when you come to run that over, you end up with some really nice textured seams again. And you can do that over every seam. This is what, what I generally will work on. All the pocket edges, all the, the outer seams, anything which has got a double seam on it, go to work on them. You're not cutting all the way through, you're just trying to cut the top layer. Because it's, what, three, four layers of fabric there? You're just trying to cut the top layer and then drag it out with a wire brush to create this texture. And again, once that goes through the washing machine, it mats down nicely. On, on base edges, like on your lower edge of a jacket or whatever, you can really go to town. You can put, you can combine all three and basically go all the way through, get some good cuts in here, yeah. Then take your serve form and really peel that apart, yeah. So you're getting some serious damage on the bottoms here. And then take your wire brush and tease out those fabrics. Um, I generally tend to use a heavier duty wire brush, like a wooden one, much tougher bristles on it. And I would say you want to be working quite hard and quite long in this particular process using the wire brush. Because when you get to the edge of the fabric, you're just teasing out the first few lines of thread. The more you work on that, the more vertical fibres you will release and the more horizontal fibres you'll drag out. And you can get a really good fringe doing that. It takes time, everything takes time, there's no shortcuts to really aging stuff. But if you work hard on that, really tease those fibres out, work all those horizontal fibres down, and you can start to see it going on. If you want to have a look, you can start to see where it's working, the fibres are working their way up into the body of the fabric. And the more of those you get, the more matting, the more texture you build up. And I say, it's, for me, it's all about texture. It's about creating more than just a flat surface, yeah? So, to recap, we've got working on your edges, your cuffs, your collars, your asses, your elbows, all of that, where the heavy wear and tear will happen. Then, if you want to add some patches, I like patches because, again, you can fray the edge of the patch, which, again, adds more texture, which adds more movement to the costume. Um, so generally I try and put quite a few patches on, even if there's not a hole underneath. Find, mm, yeah, looks a nice patch there, I'll put one there, or yeah, show off my ass. Um, and on the patches you can really go even deeper. So you get a lot of, a lot of fibres hanging out of the edge of the patches. And again, if it's cotton, once you put it through the washing machine, those fibres are mapped together and look as though they've been in that state for years. Um, also, for cotton fabric, bleaching works quite well. Now, the trouble with bleaching is you're never quite sure what colour it's going to bleach to. Yeah? Blacks tend to go kind of an orangey red, <laughs> which is great, but maybe that's not the colour you want. However, if you always test on a little discrete sample first, yeah, just to see what colour go, am I happy with that? Yeah, I'm happy with that. Once you've added some visual, some more visual texture, like this lady's dress there, you can dye it. But you can dye it with not what they recommend on the box to dye, do a full dye. Cut that down by maybe a half or even down to a third of what they recommend. 
and you will die into that bleached area. Yeah. So again, you've got fading going on there, but you may, as I say, with dyeing, want to tweak the actual colour that it bleaches down to, because greens and browns kind of work okay. Blacks can go very red, and that might not be the colour you're after. It might be, but. Again, my mouth has gone dead dry. This is an amazing place to talk in, isn't it? <laughs> As anybody will attest, in the UK I can talk for bloody ages, but... <laughs> I'm, getting some, I'm getting some nods from the UK contingent. Yeah, over here. yeah <laughs> screw them. He's finally made Apart his match. my delightful wife, of course. <laughs> yes. Whoa. Just Whoa. in time. Easy. Love you, darling. Okay, I can feel my lips again, that's good. <laughs> Okay, there's some stuff missing here, but Mark says that he likes to use watered down fabric paint on wet fabrics so it creates soft edge colors rather than hard edge splatters or strokes. And back to it. So lay your plastic sheet out, put some fabric paint on it, water down, and then scrumple up your fabric and just dab it around. Wet again, use it wet. And you'll get a lot of random, it'll hit the highlights, it'll hit the tops of the creases and that can give a really nice overall effect. You do it with darks and lights and alternate between the two and you'll build up some really nice, again, visual colour textures on your fabric to accentuate your, your physical textures in the fabric. Another way you can do it is, there's a lot, does anybody here do like paint miniatures or model kits or anything like yeah. that? A lot of the techniques you use for those can be used on fabric, such as dry brushing uh, and washes, but with I don't actually have a wide enough brush here to demonstrate this, but basically like a one inch brush, one and a half inch flat brush, get some paint on it, this time not quite so watery, but brush it out so the brush is almost dry, so there's very little paint left on it. And then you're just catching the top of all those ridges and then you rebundle it, go over the top again. And using a dry brush, do not do this with a wet brush because you'll get too much on there and it starts to look artificial. If you do get to that point, go woo, spray some water on it, give it a scrunch up and you'll be able to bleed out the edges. Because all of this is about making the edges bleed. Hard, paint strokes, hard spatters look like paint. And what we're trying to aim for is ingrained dirt and dust and all of that. I'm just gonna moisten my mouth again. When you say dry brush, is that applying it to a dry fabric as well or a wet fabric? Either. You can do it on, you get two different effects. If you're doing it on a, a dry fabric, you'll get a crisper effect. If you do it on too wet a fabric, what you might end up with is that it disappears too much. You don't actually get to see it. Also, what you'll get if you paint, if you're dry brushing on wet fabric, is you're re-moistening the paint. So it'll kind of, it won't dry brush so much because you end up using a wet brush, which is, you know, being bled on from the fabric. So generally, I would do the dry brushing once the fabric has mostly dried out, yeah? But the process is for using, uh, for using on wet fabric are, for me, the spattering, uh, the, the scrumbling where you've got to, you know, get some paint on a surface, dab it around, not too much. Again, if you put on too much, you're gonna get hard edges. So, it's much better to err on the side of caution, go, yeah, that's not enough, than go, whoa, too much. <laughs> so, patience. Yeah, a lot of this is patience as well, that you're not going, oh, I want everything now, give it to me. It's like, no, this is gonna take me a few hours to do. But, you know, age and texture and distressing doesn't come quick. A recent technique that I picked up for fabric, I got this from um, Bloodshot Bell. Do anybody know her on Instagram or whatever? She's lovely. We met her in Old Town uh, together with uh, um, Wasteland Pirate and 
fantastic people, but Bloodshot Bell shared a technique which I hadn't come across, which I've adopted very quickly because I love it. Now, this was one of those challenges I gave uh, Jared, where I said, I'm after bitumen. It's B-I-T-U-M-E-N. Now, in the UK, where we get a lot of rain, it's used, it's like a black tar mastic. It's a, a tar paste, and it's used for repairing um, felt roofs, asphalt roofs. Yeah, do you? The shingles? Yeah, yeah, shingles. It's a black mastic, and it's tar based, and it is fantastic for aging fabric, for getting a real good greasy feel, because we've got some nice dry ones, and I'll come back to more dusty effects in a minute. But uh, if you want to create oily stains, your character's mechanic, I mean, that jacket there, that waistcoat, really lovely, deep, oily, polished surfaces, which again is something you get after years, wear and tear, you get a bit of a sheen on fabrics. It's fabric wax. Yeah. The, the bitumen works really lovely because what it does starts off black but as you work it out with a stiff brush into the fabric it starts to go brown. Now blacks will separate depending on what the, the, the mixture of the paint or whatever you're using is. They will separate sometimes into blues, sometimes into blacks and sometimes into browns. Um, and you don't really want the blue, you want the brown, because that gives a really nice oily finish. If you can find bitumen, I don't know what it's called here, but it is a black tar-based mastic. I apply it with a really short, stiff brush, small stiff brush. And you can see on here where I've worked it into all the seams and areas like here, this is all mastic. The other advantage that mastic has is that before it dries, it's sticky. It's basically a, a tar glue. While it's at that stage, it's perfect for mixing in some dust. Now, <laughs> this is kind of like bringing dust <laughs> to the wasteland, but whatever. <laughs> um, I use this stuff called Fuller's Earth. It's basically clay. It's a really fine powdered clay and it's perfect for dust. I'm never going to get that out now. Um, if you're applying this to a still damp mastic, the uh, bitumen, it will stick. It will bond with it and you can get, especially on textured fabrics or textured materials like straps, You'll get a lot of a heavy weave in a strap, so you get a, you'll really be able to see the fibres, the dips in between the stitching lines and the raised tops of the stitching lines. Now, if you're working bitumen into that, you get a really nice dark depth to it, and then if you're just brushing a bit of Fuller's Earth over the top, you'll get a light raised top. It takes a bit of practice. Quite often what you'll get is it, it'll all just go in and mat up everything, but then just reapply. It's, if, you, if you fuck it up, just reapply it. It doesn't matter. Everything is building up texture. Now, you might say, ah, yeah, fine, but I can't get full as earth. Well, what I also use is cat litter, because cat litter is basically full as earth. Um, I use a mortar and pestle to grind it up into a powder and apply that. And you can get that anywhere. So if you haven't got ready access to Fuller's Earth or you don't want to buy a big pot of it, just get a bag of cat litter, yeah, and grind that up. And that makes perfect, perfect dust, yeah. I would recommend not using the stuff out of the tray. <laughs> but then again, you're going to get a nice aroma with it as well. So, you know, if you want to work on the whole smell side. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, it's... It's basically the same stuff, and generally it's cheaper as well. Um, so I use that a lot. You can also apply that very easily using spray clear varnish. Can get the top off. There you go. And you just basically use this as an adhesive. Now this isn't so washable. 
Yeah, if you're going to put this in a machine wash afterwards, chances are you'll have to reapply it afterwards. And mat it into the paint, then you can reapply the clear over the top. And you can do this a couple of times if you want to build up a, a bigger depth to it. So that will stick quite well. Yeah? Now again, I'm never happy with just leaving it there. I want to add more texture to it, more visual texture to it. So what I'll also use is um, PVA mixed with a little bit of brown acrylic. Or you can get like a brown acrylic varnish from your home store or whatever. And very similar to the way I applied the paint onto the wet fabric, I'll spatter over the top of that and you start getting dark stains, dark spatters. Looks like oil, looks like something nasty. It'll stop it just being a flat, dusty patch. And again, raise the texture in that, raise the visual texture of it and give you more surface interest. You combine all of these and that's pretty much how I approach aging fabrics. It's a lot of layers, it's a lot of textures, it's a lot of applications. Don't expect it to go quick, don't expect it to be a fast process. But if you do it right, you take time and care and patience with it, you'll end up with something which really looks as though it's been living here for 10, 20 years. There is a matter of context in terms of how you're aging stuff and what you're aging. Hang on, dry mouth again. I have to say I'm really liking my wasteland diet. Oh, it's yeah, just yeah. pounds are dropping off. This is great. <laughs> um, yeah, there is a matter of context as well. Here, obviously, your dirt and dust is dirt and dust from the desert. <laughs> If somebody turns up here with a costume which looks as though it's been dragged through the mud, as really browns and darks and muddy, that could kind of not work within the context. Likewise, in the UK, if I'm going to post-apocalyptic LARPs or airsoft events, in the UK, we've got a lot of mud. Oh, we're rolling in mud. Walking into an environment like that, covered in dust, kind of stands out so that there is a degree of context of where you're going to be wearing these costumes yeah here obviously you want dust you want oils you want that palette of colors you don't necessarily want mud and crust that wouldn't be appropriate to this environment but hey fuck it use whatever you want um, I'm just going through my list here. Right, okay. Um, other ways, we were talking about getting polished fabrics. Um, very much like yours. You were saying fabric wax. Yeah. I use those. Also, candle, just a candle rubbed over, works really well. You can use a heat gun or hot air dryer to let that sink in to the fabric. So you soften it up, you moisten the, the candle wax and that'll sink into the fabric more. You can also use, also use boot polish, um, which if you apply it for long enough and with as no, of, enough dedication, you can get almost a leathery finish to a fabric. Um, and those, those waxy, I'm, I'm just looking at yours because it's a perfect example. Do you want to give us a spin? Show us that sexiness. Yeah. <laughs> You're a man. Um, she could do a donut in that, surely. Um, but yeah, the, the oily finishes, the polishes, again, you're working very much on the same sort of areas you're working at for the, the fabric ragging that I was talking about. You'll be getting a polished ass where you've sat in a, an oil patch. You'll be getting uh, cuffs and areas around tops of legs where you've cleaned your hands off after cleaning out the sump. 
think of the areas which would naturally get that sort of wear and tear, that sort of application, and focus on those. Dust also works well once you've, if you've done this dark, oily finish with either your bitumen or your candle wax or your boot polish or your fabric wax, then you can apply dust back into that. That'll sink into the creases. You can brush it off the top. And again, you're building up all those surface textures, all those layers of aging. I think that's pretty much, where was I going on this? Sorry. I don't want to leave anything out. Okay, right. That pretty much covers the basic paint and physical aging approach to aging fabrics. Now, I think possibly, have you got rust dyeing on there? Yeah. Yeah, well, well rust dyeing is what I'm gonna move on to next. Because rust dyeing is beautiful. It can produce some beautiful effects. Basically, again, it works best on cotton fabrics because they you're dyeing, basically using iron oxide, the rust. And it works best on cotton fabrics, but it will work on other fabrics, but it might not be as durable. Rust dyeing, get yourself a nice collection of old rusty tools, spanners, monkey wrenches, old cogs, just interesting shapes. Soak those in a mixture of just household vinegar, um, a lot of salt, a big pile of salt, and water. I'd do maybe 50-50 water and vinegar mix. Chuck a load of salt in that and let it all let all that salt dissolve. You can also speed up the process with hydrogen peroxide, which is a big oxidizer. You can add a few drops of that to the mix. But when using hydrogen peroxide or any chemicals, please, health and safety. I mean, I unfortunately see a lot of people with dubious health and safety practices when they're making stuff. Go, oh, just spray that there, that'll be fine. Yeah, it's only a bit of spray. All of this stuff you're breathing in, stuff can get in your eyes. I mean, something like this is gonna really do damage if it gets in your eyes. This is a bit of a, a bit of a bugbear with me, so I'll just do it now. Is that you've only got one pair of eyes, you've only got one pair of lungs, you've only got one pair of hands. And if you lose any of those, you're fucked, yeah? <laughs> you're especially fucked if you wanna make things. If you still happen to be alive after it, you're yeah, fucked if you want to make things. Please, 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 always, always protect your eyes and your lungs. Because I see so many bad practices out there. I'm even in the TV and film industry. Um, I don't know how many of you know, I have worked on Doctor Who. I ran the props department there. And even in a company like the BBC, some of the health and safety practices there were fucking criminal. Um, you can protect yourself. Please, please protect yourself, okay? Right, that's that bit over and done with. Mark, can I just say something real quick on that? Yep. Um, so, I, I, I have a lot of friends who work in, in LA as well, and some, unfortunately some of it's prevalent there too. Uh, the one handy phrase that I always heard from the, the customers union was about wearing gloves. Is they always say, dye your hands, dye your liver. Always, if you're, if that dye is getting onto your skin, it is having to be processed by your liver, and it will catch up with you. Yeah, very true. And there, and there have a lot of, sadly, there have a lot of people that have died young who work in the effects industry. Uh, I mean, people remember Stan Winston. A lot of people believe that that blood cancer he got was from all those chemicals he used to use back when they worked yep. safe. So it is serious. And even though we just dabble in this stuff, wear gloves, wear a respirator, work outside if you can. Yeah, actually that's, that's reminded me. Um, I have a couple of friends in the UK who do a lot of beautiful, beautiful leather work, but at least one of them, his hands are permanently brown from the leather dye and he just doesn't use gloves. And it, it's, you never see him without brown hands. 
but it has reminded me of another application on the leather which I haven't put down on my list which is um, on the fabric sorry which is using leather dye if you're using um, spirit based leather dyes not water based leather dyes which you can get but if you use spirit based leather dyes again using that flicking onto wet fabric and then spritzing it mm. what you find is it bleeds out really really nicely yeah perfect and it it kind of it I don't quite know how to describe it but it has a different a subtly different effect from using fabric dyes and again it's you can build up texture it's especially good on top of like a lighter surface if you've got the dust on there if you just spritz it with water just flick it with your uh, leather dye and spritz it again and it'll just bleed out but I'll come back to leather dye um, when we get on to the next one however I was on rust dyeing before I went off on my rant um, rust dyeing so get yourself a nice selection of old tools and cogs and bits of interesting shaped metals soak them in that mix of the vinegar the water and the salt and maybe a bit of hydrogen peroxide as long as you take care soak them in there for a few hours and then take them out because the rust process is oxidization and it needs air yeah if you just leave them in the mixture they're not going to rust up that well it's going to take a long time take them out and then keep them damp they will rust up quicker although I have to say I have no idea how that works out here but in the UK it works all right but I would do it out of the sun um, and after a few days a week even maybe two you will build up a nice surface layer of rust now obviously you want to degrease anything like cogs before you do all of this so make sure that you've got rid of any surface grease rubbing alcohol wire brush soap and water even detergent but once you've done that and you've built up a nice layer of rust you can use these to dye fabric and it's a beautiful effect because basically you're getting imprints of the tools that you're using and you can create some really nice patterns I did like a, a skull and crossbone in rust dyed uh, two, uh, two monkey wrenches it was and then a cog at the top and you can create all these interesting patterns and you apply these onto wet fabric the, the fabric that you're applying has to be wet and you have to keep everything wet afterwards for the whole process of the dyeing which might be days might be a couple of weeks depending on how deep you want the dye to go and what I do is I will get these rusty items, put them on the fabric strategically, wrap them up, put them in the bin bag, put them in a black plastic bag, and then using a spritzer with the same mixture that I've soaked the uh, rusty items in, just keep everything damp every day, just keep it damp. And after days, a couple of weeks maybe, you'll end up with a lot of rust imprints on the fabric and it'll bleed so everything kind of turns as you can see on this lady with on her top there it bleeds out and it comes a really lovely rusty orange color now if you want to accentuate that if you're going well okay it's just staying in the areas where I've applied the tools or the cogs what you can use is this wonderful stuff which has a lot of uses open you can get this on Amazon uh, if you look at iron powder and usually that's where I ordered this little bag this is indeed iron powder it's used a lot for cold casting resin cold casting and literally it is just the finest powder which is iron now this has a massive surface to volume ratio so it oxidizes really quickly and you'll get a lot of good rust out of this. Now you can, in the process of dyeing the fabric with rust, accentuate it with this. Get a sieve and sprinkle it over in the areas you want and that will create larger areas, larger patches of rust because this stuff rusts really quickly. It's, it's fantastic. Once you have the desired level of rust on your, your fabric, 
put it through the washing machine, but put it through the washing machine with a lot of salt, and that helps fix the rust into the fabric. And once you've done that, you can rewash that fabric and rewash it. And again, I've got a couple of long sleeve uh, tees that I did a couple of years ago using this exact process, and they've been washed. 10, 20 times in a washing machine on a delicate setting, yeah, don't go for the full-on boil wash, but they survive washing. And again, it's really nice to have a base layer that you can wash after you've been to an event, yeah, because this is wasteland, but out there, poof. So yeah, again, you end up with something which will be durable, be washable, and looks really unique. You can create some beautiful pieces. It doesn't even have to be a piece of clothing. You want to create a banner or something. Again, using cottons because they take the dye best. But you can create banners, you could do your big skull and crossbones if you've got a couple of big rusty old monkey wrenches or spanners or something. The cog and create beautiful pictures. So it would be lovely to see, you know, maybe a, a camp banner done entirely in rust dye. So that's a technique which I think I'd love to see more people use because I just think it's a beautiful effect. Uh, just something I picked up online, but yeah, I'm a big fan of it. We've got about uh, five or 10 more minutes. I think. Okay, Sorry, this is, this is yeah. fine. Right, five, 10 more minutes. Now I'm gonna do fake rust on hard items, okay? This, <coughs> somewhere, there you go. You guys call it crazy glue, um, I call it super glue, whatever. It's a cyanoacetate acrylate glue, super glue, yeah? This is incredibly useful stuff if you want to create rust. Because under the action, I'm not going to use it on your gun, Jared, because I'm, I'm not going to use it on your gun because I'm only going to do a really short piece. So I'll, Try and do it on a different surface. You might want to step closer for this. I'm not sure how well it's going to work on this surface. However, under the application of water, super glue blisters. Yeah? If you've ever used a super glue accelerator, it's nasty stuff. You don't need to use that. Use water because this glue works on moisture. That's what kicks it. That's what starts it drying but you apply some water to it and you get a really lovely texture because the whole thing just blisters up and it blisters up very similar to how rust will blister up yeah you can apply this to a good plastic surface or metal surfaces and once it's dry you can paint it and how many colors do you reckon are in rust <laughs> well, basically two, yellow ochre and burnt sienna are the two main colours I use. You mix those up in various ratios and you will get most of the rust colours, tones you ever need. Now you can paint that over the top of that and once it's dry, take some of this, which is a black graphite polish. We use it for stoves and stuff. It's just basically graphite polish. Apply a bit of this onto a cloth, dry, rub it over the top so it just catches the tops of the surface, the top points of the rust texture, and you'll end up with something which is really convincing. You notice in rust, if something's been, if rust has built up, but there's still been a lot of physical traffic over it, the tops of the rust will polish, almost back to the metal leaving the rust in the indentations. This replicates that effect. And you can buff it up and it shines up to a really convincing metal. This is great for making plastic look like metal. Yeah, very useful. However, this was the technique I was using for quite a while. And works nicely until one day I thought, well, I wonder what happens a bit of super glue and then a bit of iron powder into that oh, shit. and then spritz it 
Right, this is a process which takes a few hours, maybe even a couple of days, but the basic principle is, if you've got rivets, you know, I've got a lot of popper rivets and stuff on here, yeah? And they're nice and shiny, and take fucking ages to rust up. However, a dab of super glue, some iron filing powder, iron powder on it, and then spritz it with your vinegar, water, salt mix. Leave it, within about a day, two at the most, you've got genuine rust built up on it. And that rust stays because the super glue has bonded it to the surface and it becomes really durable. So if you want to hide nice shiny rivets or metal fixings, you're going, yeah, it's too shiny. That works perfectly and it's really, really durable and works on all surfaces. What I will say is when, quickly onto solid items, if you're painting anything, if you're applying anything like this, prep your surfaces, degrease them, yeah? No matter how many top layers of varnish or whatever you put over something, if the paint hasn't bonded with that initial layer with your, your surface, it's going to chip off or flake or scratch. But if you prime your surface properly and then paint on top of that, you'll get a much more durable finish, yeah? Use wire wool, use sandpaper, use whatever you need. Use uh, surgical spirit, rubbing alcohol. Just degrease that surface, give it a bit of a rough, something that the paint can key into. For plastics, you can use this as a good base primer. Don't use it as a top coat, use it as a base coat, because this sticks really well to plastic. So key your surface, apply this, then apply your paints over the top. Also, chips, dents, damage to things like guns. Get some files, put some chips in the, all the edges, where it's been dropped, where it's been knocked against something. And those, again, I come back to texture. Those add texture to things like guns or items, tools, whatever. Rub the rust into the lower surface textures, build up some rust areas using the super glue and the iron filings buff over the top the raised areas using this and you will build up a really nice layer of textures rubbing paints acrylics work really well you can get spray paints spray it on rub it off while it's wet just leave dusty colors into the the indents add a bit of rust to that bob's your uncle is that a phrase over here yeah. 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 <laughs> i suspect that's probably me done is it Woo. Yeah, I think we should probably get over to the doll workshop. Okay. Well, thanks, guys. It's fucking hot. Thank you for standing. Yeah. 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 Uh, I really appreciate yeah. you guys turning up, and I hope if you if you find me around and you want to ask questions, please do. But I'm heading over to the doll workshop now. Now, for those of you who are signed mutilate. up for the doll workshop, you can head over there with us. For those of you who are on the wait list, I think we may have room for some more people. Or if you just want to observe, we might there will be a space where you can kind of take a look at what we're doing. Uh, if I could get one or two volunteers. Hey guys, thanks for sticking around to the end. Don't forget to subscribe, hit that thumbs up, and comment with your best costuming tricks. Later survivors, stay alive.